So I'm an executive producer at Ardman Animations and I feel slightly like a fish out of water here because you might well ask what does an animation producer know about healthcare or any of the issues you're discussing? And the answer is absolutely nothing. But when, what, what, when you ask what does an animation producer know about hearing what people are saying and communicating with wide audiences, we like to think we do know something about that. So today I'm going to talk to you about two different ideas. One is about the, uh, the idea of giving value and space to individual people and contributions. And the second one is a way of gathering in meaningful information and then using it in a way that can be corroborated and used in, as evidence to take ideas forward. So many of you will be aware of our Creature Comforts program where we recorded hundreds of people all over the country talking about different types of issues in their own way. We then took that information and um, distilled the most interesting clips and then put them against talk, talking animals. We then um, used that same formula to create a campaign for Leonard Cheshire Disability, which I'm going to show you a couple of examples of. And the way we did this is by making sure the environment was very informal, very open, very relaxed, and allows for candour in the, in the interviews. There was no tick boxing, there was no prescriptive questioning. Um, if the, the brief was always, if an inter, if a interviewee wants to talk about something that's slightly different to the question you're actually trying to answer, go with it and let them go with it, and you get more interesting answers that way. Obviously, we were trying, with this, with this particular project, we were trying to um, engage, entertain, but also inform and change attitudes towards disability. So, uh, the other thing we do with this is put these stories in a very personal context. So they're very individual and they have kind of authenticity from that point of view. I tend to only go to places that are accessible. Recently, come across places which aren't, which are a bit difficult for me. I only wanted to buy some sweets for my children. And I went down to a sweet shop and couldn't get in. It makes me feel a bit cross, a bit frustrated more than anything. And I lose, lose the will to get sweets in. Change the way you see disability. So obviously the whole, the, the ideas were taken away from the individual that, that was talking, but brought them much closer to people, I think, in a way where they weren't distracted by any of that stuff. It's really about what is this person trying to say. Um, got another very quick example as well. Some people think because you have a disability, maybe you should be with someone with a disability. And it doesn't work like that. You can't help who you fall in love with. I think that if you're disabled, you can't have a love life. That's not true, though. Know? One can have sex. <laughs> Change the way you see disability. Visit Leonard Cheshire Disability at creaturediscomforts.org. So the next project I want to share a bit about you with you is about the Tate Movie Project. And this project was about making a film with for and with all the children of the UK. So it was a massive um, undertaking. And the way we did this was in creating road shows that went around all, the whole country, 55 different locations. We had story workshops with children. We took ideas from one workshop and developed them in the next workshop. Um, there was a big website at the hub of the whole thing, which had different rooms, which represented a virtual film studio. So you have like an editing room and a picture room, and a writing room, and a music room. So everybody was able to contribute. And we had over 25,000 actively involved in the online community. Um, and we had over 150,000 submissions, pieces of work, to actually get into the final half-hour film. Um, but about 3,000 children did get their work into the final film. But the legacy of what was created which was far greater than the film. It went on for another two years. And the community just didn't want to give it, give it up. And we had a hardcore audience of about 150 kids who just were desperate for the project to keep going, but there was no more money, the project was over. So we had a big party at the Tate Museum to thank them all. Um, but here's a short making of which we can feel for the whole, the whole project. All right, how are you? So, let me set the scene. Last year, Tate wanted to get more kids aged 5 to 13 inspired by art. You know, not just splashing paint around, but really excited by it. 
Ta-da! The Tate Movie Project. Tate got involved in this a couple of years ago when Fallon, uh, the creative agency that we work with, came to us with this idea. We had this kind of loose idea that we wanted to, to make a film with kids. A world first, never been done before. Every kid has something creative in it. We really wanted to get something that would bring that fire out of them, and no matter how small it is, whether it was a little drawing or a little word or they had an idea for a, some dialogue, I had no idea that we'd be here now talking to some great actors that are going to do the voiceovers, you know, talking about kind of involving you know, amazing people. Whoever wrote this, thank you for the words, it's been fun. We're working with Ardman on this and they've been absolutely brilliant in teasing out from children the kind of freshness of ideas that could only have come from a child's mind. There was ambitions to make this film accessible to every child in Britain so that every child would have a chance to contribute. The drawing and the design is just so beautiful and it's much nicer than anything I could ever do in a way. Um, I just completely take everything from the children so if you've got a forest all the trees are drawn by the children and if it's got grass, the grass, I find textures of grass that children have drawn. All of the drawn content has been 100% from the kids. We're just kind of taking that final uh, tweak to, to make it professional. Thousands of children got involved in the website, but we also wanted to get out and meet kids face to face. So Tate put on a road show. We got a big truck, we kitted it out as a mobile movie studio. We went to 55 locations around the country. We had fantastic support from CBBC who joined the project and Andy from Blue Peter was just great at getting kids really excited. We're launching our brand new movie making challenge. <laughs> We went into galleries up and down the country and did workshops there with the kids and overall we had 9,000 children involved. In each gallery the, the kids would go around look at paintings and then we talked about ideas that came from those paintings. And we brought in Lucy Murphy as the script editor. We did story workshops. Okay. Lucy would make all the notes of everything that was discussed in the workshop. Then we'd send those to Dave. We'd say, we really like this character, we really like this location. And he'd start to build a story. It's very, very tempting as a writer to say, oh, I know what to do, I'll put this there and that could go there, but I can't do that. It's really got to come from them. The ideas that are coming through are just fabulous. We hunted for ages to find the exact right voice for Beryl and the exact right voice for Beanie. You Beanie, we've got Bobby Fuller, who's just brilliant. He's exactly right. I can always do it when there's no one watching. See? Oh, sick! The new Ten Heart Heroes! And then Rachel Rawlinson is Beryl. The actual sun. You do know you can't get within 60 million miles of it without burning up, don't you? Although there'd be children voicing some of the characters in the film, a lot of the superheroes and villains looked adult so that we wanted um, adult actors to play it. So I just started thinking about the best actors that I'd know for each character. I had Harry Enfield. What are we doing? I just said you're a dad and you're relentlessly cheerful and he became the most brilliantly embarrassing dad. I'm a mad, mad dad, oh yes I am. A mad, mad dad, oh yes I am. In the script, the mum and nothing can faze her. And I know kids really love Miranda's programme and the way she plays that character, it just seemed to match. And the same with David Walliams doing the Golden Knit. Haven't you seen the Golden Knit before? Up a bit, down a bit, and Bob's your ding dong, dear. You can't miss it. Well, this may come as a shock looking at such a fine specimen as myself, but I'm not all good. Whoa, my name is Stella, I am the best. This couldn't be any more embarrassing. I'm working with a composer called John Brown and I wanted to work with him because he'd done a lot of opera with kids. Um, I've, we've been working with uh, five-year-olds, year ones, who just at the stage of being able to pick up the instrument. Um, right up to National Youth Orchestra, who are so professionals. We're not only playing sort of lyrical passages, we're also making sounds using our instruments or using body parts. So we've tapped into kind of existing groups of musical children and brought the Take Movie project to them. 
I think Tate Movie Project is unique because of the scale and ambition of it, but it, it's also about collaboration. And essentially, getting thousands of children together to make their own movie. I mean, it's a crazy, impossible idea, but I think it might just work. So, two thoughts then. What if you could... The, way, the Leonard Cheshire type of animation is a really expensive thing to do. There is no way anybody could afford or would, would it be valid to make animations of everybody's ideas about healthcare. But what if there was a way you could just raise the, raise the status of the issues and start the conversation off by picking a few stories, by finding a few stories, which would drive people to want to engage? And the great thing about animation, of course, is that it has no... Um, social or demographic or cultural backgrounds. You don't have to do animals, but you know they, you don't have to. It's not tokenistic in that way of representing. It represents people in a more general fashion. And what if there was a way of creating uh, people contributing to all the different parts of the conversations online in a meaningful way? So that would you would get qualitative information about what people were thinking about the issues and what they thought might be some ideas and forums about other people contributing to the, discuss to the discussion and challenging um, back and forth. And then what if there was a way of having that as an app so people could give you the, their thoughts when they're sitting in waiting rooms or travelling to the bus at times when they've got time to do it? Um, just two thoughts for you. And that's it, really. Thank you. Thank you.